Dr. Malhal, you are a board certified urologist, a microsurgeon, and you specialize in sexual and reproductive medicine and surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering. That is correct. And you've just come off doing a session, neurologic treatment of men's cancer-related sexual dysfunction. That is also correct. So what we're going to talk about are some of the points that we want to drive home for women who are going through this experience, most likely uh, urologic or prostate cancer, mm -hmm. with the men they love. It's a shared disease. And we'll also talk about some of the issues that really impact men, uh, especially on a psychosocial level when they're diagnosed. So, so let me just broaden the, the discussion because um, it's not just about prostate cancer. Only 50% of our patients referred to our clinic are actually uh, urologic cancers. So for example, any man who goes through bone marrow or stem cell transplant, any man who's got a leukemia or lymphoma who's exposed to chemotherapy, or total body irradiation or testicular radiation boosts are at profound risk of having a sexual problem, whether it's low libido, orgasmic pain, erectile dysfunction. So I think the, the concept that cancer-related sexual dysfunction in men is really pelvic malignancy related is, um, is false. And I think we need to broaden our perspective when we're talking about this. So there may be women who are looking at this whose husbands have had bone marrow transplant. They are at risk for having low testosterone, for example. And we need to educate them about that. Dr. Mulhall, what about side effects with chemotherapy or any of the new targeted therapies on sexuality? Well, well first of all, with targeted therapies, there's really not very much literature on the sexual consequences of that. Uh, we would expect that they would almost certainly have lower effects directly on sexual function in general. Um, however, of course, the stress associated with the diagnosis of cancer or its treatment in and of itself is a problem in that adrenaline is the world's most potent anti-erection chemical. Okay? So any stressor in a man's life is going to lead to problems with uh, reduced erection hardness, decreased libido, difficulty achieving orgasm. But standard chemotherapy does not directly cause a problem with um, sexual function. What it does do is cause problems with testosterone production. And testosterone, from a sexual standpoint, is vitally important for libido and is a contributor to the health of erectile tissue, so it can be uh, an impactor upon erectile function also. As I listen to you speak, I think about what's probably missing in the medical oncology circle and needs to be expanded into the dialogue is upon diagnosis and the initiation of treatment that a patient and doctor should be addressing this really important area of sexuality. Yeah. So the average physician gets about two hours of sexual health education in medical school. So it is impossible to make them completely comfortable. Uh, for example, if a man's medical oncologist is a woman and she's 60 and he's 28, then the chances of having that discussion are actually very low. So I think that really what we want to do is we want to empower patients and their partners to initiate that discussion. There is this concept that we as physicians need to be bringing it up, but many physicians don't. For example, it is estimated that only 12% of men in the United States of America ever get asked about their sexual health by a physician. So I think there's a lot of work that we have yet to do, and this is a very powerful tool that you're using in that we're reaching out to men and women to really start the ball rolling. So if you were to role play a little bit, and you were now sitting at a consultation with a husband and wife, and that you yourself as a physician would anticipate there might be some sexual problems creeping up as a byproduct of this surgery, treatment, whatever, could you share with me the way you would engage with this couple to sort of elicit this discussion? So first of all, people come to me because they're interested in their sexual health. We have a practice that basically is entirely devoted to sexual and reproductive health. So it's not that I have to uh, dig information out of them. They come in to me and voluntarily um, uh, discuss this. A core philosophy of my practice, and I believe a core philosophy for any physician in practice, particularly oncology, is realistic expectations. And realistic expectations leads into the whole concept of individualized outcomes. For example, let's say for the prostate cancer patient, that 75-year-old man who hasn't had sex in 10 years, the discussion with that man is entirely different than the 49-year-old man who's married to a 28-year-old woman who's concerned not just about his sex life but his fertility. So we need to be individualizing our discussion with our patients. And what we don't do a very good job of, for many reasons, is giving patients realistic expectations. And so what I would say to a patient or a couple, if I was an oncologist, is I would say, 
Let's talk about the things that are important to you with regard to your cancer and its treatment. Obviously, you're concerned about surviving your cancer, but what other things are important to you? And I will go down a checklist. Is fertility important to you? Is your sexual health important to you? And if we don't ask those questions, or we don't empower patients to ask those questions, then patients go through a treatment in a state of high anxiety because they want to make sure their cancer is cured. And then two years down the road, they're worried about, well, how come I'm infertile? And how come my erections don't work anymore? Or it's, I'm having difficulty achieving an orgasm? And of course, those effects have long-lasting relationship effects. Particularly if the woman is perimenopausal or postmenopausal, those women accommodate very rapidly to an asexual lifestyle. And it's very difficult for a man to get back on track. The testosterone supplementation in a man, let's say, who's had bone marrow transplant, mm -hmm is quite different than it would be in a man who has had more radical prostate-related surgery, I would imagine. So the whole concept of testosterone supplementation in the prostate cancer patients is a very complicated discussion. For the average man who has low testosterone, including the man who's had a bone marrow transplant or any chemotherapy-associated hypogonadal patient, is, is basically a standard discussion. And we're looking at a blood test and we're looking at symptoms. And the symptoms of low testosterone are low energy, fatigability, mood irritability, decreased sex drive, uh, falling asleep after meals, de decreased strength, decreased endurance, loss of muscle, increased fat. They're very nonspecific symptoms. They're the symptoms of chronic depression, chronic fatigue, and chronic stress. But with a blood test and those symptoms, we feel that a man is a candidate for testosterone supplementation, which these days is just a gel. Yes, I was going to ask, is it transdermal patch, gel, oral? While we're not on camera, I will tell you, my, my, I have a lot of frustration with the uh, whole issue and almost the stigma of women who might need, especially after oophorectomy, some um, testosterone uh, replacement, but that's another discussion. Yeah, yeah I'm happy such to a, touch on that. Such a stigma. Right. Um, I want to come back. So the um, delivery method of testosterone is what? So uh, the first-line treatment for testosterone supplementation, direct testosterone supplementation, is the use of a gel. There are two gels that are uh, commercially available in, on the market. I would just caution the, the people looking at this um, to avoid using compounded drugs made by your local pharmacy. The reason that the uh, pharmaceutical industry-sponsored drugs are expensive is that they are proprietary vehicles that have been researched over years to drive the drug testosterone across the skin. So what we, what we know is in men who are using these compounded drugs, they don't absorb very well or they absorb in a very inconsistent fashion. So it's a gel. And where now, do you apply the gel? The gel goes onto the arms or the back or the buttocks, generally in non-hair bearing areas. And 85% of men who use these gels get back to a normal testosterone level. The problem with testosterone, particularly for younger men, is that it impairs fertility. And so if you have a testis cancer patient, he's 32, and he's had his testis removed, and he's got one remaining testicle, and he's had chemotherapy to cure him of cancer, and we know that 98% of those patients are cured, but putting him on testosterone may suppress his sperm production, and he may be rendered permanently infertile. So there are other strategies for the man of reproductive age to boost his natural testosterone production. Clomiphene citrate, or Clomid, is a drug that does that. Women know of Clomid because of fertility reasons, infertility. And then a drug called HCG, which is an injectable drug. Neither of them have a negative effect on a man's fertility. But for the 60-year-old man who's hypogonadal post-chemotherapy, then testosterone gels are an excellent starting approach to supplement his testosterone level. What can we share with women that are watching us right now, realizing these are tender areas, they have not yet consulted with their doctor, the woman is suffering because she doesn't know how to reach out and break through perhaps a communication barrier. The man is getting angrier and frustrated. What do we do in this case to break through communication? I think the first, the first two things are A, be supportive, and B, never emasculate your partner. And unfortunately, we have you know a significant minority of couples in which the woman emasculates the man. Aren't you a man anymore? What's wrong with you? When really, what we need is support. And that woman should, in whatever way she can, knowing her partner or husband, direct him to educational resources. 
and there are many educational resources, including webcasts that I've done and other physicians have done, where the man can actually, in the privacy of his own computer room and at his time, he can go there and he can educate himself. And what we need to be doing is empowering him to make the first step to ask the right questions. We've touched on some of the cancers that may be impacted or have sexual implications. Could we just, in addition to prostate cancer, would you name some of the cancers that really are dominant in your own practice setting? Right. So, so the most dominant cancers will be pelvic cancers. So prostate cancer, bladder cancer, and rectal cancer. The treatments for those surgically, chemotherapy, radiation in patients with rectal cancer, for example, are all negative for a man's sexual health. Any cancer that is treated with chemotherapy, particularly using alkylating agents or long-term chemotherapy, are, is our, they cause a profound hypogonadism. And it's amazing to me how many patients have chemotherapy that have never had a testosterone level checked. And the way to do that, if you're a patient, is ask your doctor to write your prescription for a total testosterone level. That should be done before 10 o'clock in the morning. You do not even need to fast. There are cancers such as head and neck cancer that are caused by cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking is a potent cause of erectile dysfunction, for example. So the cancer itself doesn't necessarily cause the dysfunction, but the thing that causes the cancer causes the right. dysfunction. So lung cancer could be an Lung element. cancer will be, will be that also, that's correct. And how often is there really a, a, a psychological imperative here, meaning that clinically you would examine the patient and feel this patient is not as much uh, clinically burdened as he is emotionally, psychologically, which is also a clinical ailment, but how do you determine whether or not what you're dealing with here is a man that actually doesn't have uh, a, a sexual dysfunctional issue that's coming from uh, a physical a, cause. Yes, yes, like so a pathology. It's, it's organic versus psychological. Exactly. So 100 percent of men with erection problems have a psychological contribution. We're only as good as our last erection. And I don't say that glibly. But if a man has a bad experience, whether he's 25, like the guys behind the camera here, or he's 65, they walk into the bedroom the next time in the back of their mind second-guessing themselves. And that second-guessing leads to adrenaline, and adrenaline is the world's most potent anti-erection chemical. The hallmarks of pure psychological erection problems are sudden-onset erection problems, inconsistency of response, some nights I'm good and sometimes I'm not. And so those things are classic examples, but without testing, it's impossible for us to say. We have literature in our test as cancer patients, mean age of 32 years of age, 100% of them who develop erection problems after the diagnosis or treatment of test as cancer have psychological erection problems. The good news about that, they're entirely curable. Routinely, those men are off all drugs within 12 to 24 months after starting treatment for their erection problems. So getting to the bottom of this requires more than a two-minute conversation, and it requires seeing somebody who's physically, emotionally invested in helping these men, like somebody like me. Another question. The use uh, for the uh, prostate cancer patient of uh, the pumps and implants mm -hmm. uh, to help achieve an erection, how effective is that? Well, first of all, the process of care model drives men from first line to second line to third line therapy. First line therapy is a correction of any modifiable causes, uh, overt psychological issue addressing. So if Bill and Mary don't get on and haven't had sex in 10 years, no matter what I do for his erections, right. probably not going to be much advancing there. And then first line therapy, drug-wise, are pills, Viagra levitra cialis. Viagra levitra cialis work in all comers in about 65% of men. They probably work in about 40% of men post prostate cancer or colorectal cancer. Moving to second line therapy such as injection therapy and urethral suppositories and vacuum devices, they are uniformly successful if you put those together. And then implant surgery is reserved for men who fail second line therapy, and that will give a man a 100% erection in 10 seconds. But it's the minority of men who ever get to that stage because our drug therapy is so successful. And, and do we want to talk at all about the whole issue of sperm banking, anything with you? So let's talk about fertility preservation. So I think that just as important as sexual dysfunction 
in the cancer patient is the whole concept of fertility preservation. And one of the uh, most important uh, survivorship initiatives we have at Memorial Sloan Kettering now is the development of a fertility preservation program for men and women. And we've actually employed a uh, clinical nurse specialist whose entire job is to liaise with patients and clinicians about this program. And so if you're a man out there and you're about to get chemotherapy, um, if you can spare time to go and preserve sperm, go and give a specimen to a bank, that's critically important because it's estimated somewhere between 40 and 70 percent of men after chemotherapy have profound negative changes in their semen analysis, many of whom are left without any sperm whatsoever. So it's critically important. Unfortunately, just as the, we talked about sexual dysfunction and the discomfort that physicians have, they also have a dis the discomfort talking about ejaculation. And as you're speaking, I don't want to forget one other patient population that this impacts, which are these adolescents that get diagnosed, and they're not old enough to make their own decision because they're under 18. Parents with puritanical views that do not want to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or religious views, or religious views. So for example, w part of our program is taking these 14 and 15 year old Orthodox Jewish boys who are not allowed to masturbate and give specimens and surgically extract sperm from them using either electro ejaculation or a test of sperm extraction. And that's critically important for these young boys because societally in their culture and religion, having fertility potential is critically important for the selection of a life's partner. And so this is a huge thing that we need to be addressing. Now, not every area in the country has this population, but there are people for whom their future quality of life and their future identity is related to their fertility and who they can choose as a partner because of their fertility or lack of it. So we really need, as physicians and as patients listening to this, we need to address this upfront. And it's my vision long term that we'll have a system perhaps in conjunction with Fertile Hope, where we'll educate physicians so that every physician signs off on having a discussion with anyone going through cancer therapy of any kind. Just very quickly, orgasmic dysfunction. Um, the most common orgasmic dysfunction in men is retarded orgasm, which is the direct opposite to premature ejaculation, where they are unable to achieve an orgasm. And there are five very basic causes for that. The most common in the United States is the use of SSRI medications, Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Lexapro. The second is low testosterone. The third is chronic hyperstimulation syndrome, so men who um, aggressively self-stimulate. Uh, the fourth is penile sensory loss in diabetic men. And the fifth, also a large group, psychological. And the commonest reason for men having psychological retarded orgasm is bad erections, being stressed in the bedroom. Thank you so very much. I think you've highlighted not only for men but for women this dynamic role that couples have to engage together. So the, the quote that I always like to leave these interviews with comes from Mark Litwin, who is a health outcomes researcher from UCLA. And Mark wrote a paper back in 1995. And in the paper he had this wonderful statement which was, we should not just be focused on adding years to life, but we should also focus on adding life to years. And I think sexuality as part of the survivorship initiative is incredibly important. And I do want to mention, because I, I found this quite interesting, uh, that the World Health Organization, the WHO, has declared that every human being has the unalienable right to sexual health. Thank you for helping to ensure that. My pleasure.